Harley is here, and she's speaking on Western culture, the Holocaust, and the persistence of anti-Semitism. Catherine is a professor in the Department of History from the University of Winnipeg. She did her doctorate degree at the University of Chicago, where she did research and studied uh, the writer, the literary critic, and cultural critic George Steiner. Um, perhaps most importantly, she's from Canada. She's from the University. She studied. She did her uh, BA at the University of Manitoba and her Masters at Concordia University before going to the University of Chicago. And I had the honor, and Annette had the honor of meeting her at the uh, U.S. Holocaust Museum over the summer, where Catherine was a participant in a two-week two -week workshop we did on issues of anti-Semitism. And she impressed many people there with uh, not only her analysis of contemporary anti-Semitism, but she takes complicated, I think, ideas and makes them uh, manageable and comprehensible, and, and she takes important theory and issues that are happening in the contemporary context and historically, and um, I think gives us a deep understanding in a very manageable way. So it's really an honor that you're here, and I'm sure we're in for a treat. by saying what a pleasure it is to be at Yale University and also allow me to thank Dr. Small for inviting me to make this presentation at Lisa. Today I spent most of the day watching the Holocaust testimony of a dear friend of mine, Philip Katz, which is housed in the Fortunoff collection at Yale. So I think it's only appropriate that I dedicate this presentation to the memory of my dear friend Philip and to his family, half of whom were murdered upon arrival in Auschwitz. The title of the paper is Western Culture, the Holocaust, and the Persistence of Antisemitism. In her recent discussion of debt as metaphor, Canadian author and poet Margaret Atwood admitted to, quote, assuming that the older a recognizable pattern of behavior is, the longer it's demonstrably been with us, the more integral it must be to our humanness, and the more cultural variations on it will be in evidence, end quote. This is also my assumption, but in relation to the problem of anti-Semitism in Western culture. This paper attempts to begin a conversation about an important subject that is both disheartening and rarely discussed, the persistence of anti-Semitism in post-Holocaust Western culture. Given the increasing levels of anti-Semitism throughout the world, one wonders whether Holocaust education against our very best efforts, especially those of Holocaust survivors, has failed to educate the public about the specific nature and history of anti-Semitism. Is it possible that the dominant strategy of Holocaust universalization, a strategy perceived as necessary to make the subject accessible to non-Jews, has worked against the production of an adequate understanding of anti-Semitism in Western culture, and therefore against the exorcism of anti-Semitic thinking from Western culture? I would like to suggest that given our current context, we begin discussing the following questions. What exactly have we in the West learned from the Holocaust? Do these lessons have any, and at lessons I, I put in quotation marks, do these lessons have any relationship to the subject of anti-Semitism? Have we perhaps learned the wrong lessons when it comes to anti-Semitism? And finally, is it possible that this failure to understand the specific nature and history of anti-Semitism complicates the current academic and popular debates about the nature of anti-Zionism and the ongoing significance of anti-Semitism? The first part of the essay will discuss a selection of recent cultural observations which taken together precipitate the questions asked in this paper. The second section diagnoses a paradox in Western culture in which the public appears exhausted by their exposure to the Holocaust, but in fact knows very little about the nature and history of anti-Semitism. In an attempt to explain the reasons for this problematic contradiction, the process of Holocaust universalization is scrutinized in a discussion of the two key texts used to educate the public about the Holocaust. This paper is intended to open discussion of these subjects which require sustained and systematic study. The first section, general cultural observations. Anti-Semitism, racism against 
so-called rich Jews. As a historian of modern Europe, anti-Semitism, and the Holocaust, who has taught university courses on these subjects for the last eight years, I must admit that I do not see an adequate understanding of anti-Semitism or the Holocaust, for that matter, among the students entering my courses. It is only after taking the course that students begin to understand the unique nature and millennial history of anti-Semitism, including the Christian European responsibility for its invention and proliferation. A majority of students appear to interpret anti-Semitism simply as racism against Jews, which they perceive as the product of economic jealousy. In our increasingly secularized Western culture, fewer students seem to have been exposed to the so-called Christ-killer accusation that ruled supreme only until a generation ago. Today, instead, my students associate the Jews, and I use that again in quotation marks, that, of course, referring, that phrase referring to the abstraction created by anti-Semites rather than to individual Jews or to the Jewish people. My students associate the Jews with unbridled economic success, and this is how they appear to understand the cultural hostility emanating against Jews. Simply put, people hate Jews because Jews have money. This, unfortunately, is also how they understand the Holocaust. The Germans hated the Jews because they had too much money. Several observations can be made from this dominant student perspective. These students believe that all Jews are, in fact, wealthy and do hold an economic advantage over other groups in society. They assume that this purported Jewish economic reality explains the so-called racism that non-Jews direct toward Jews. What appears to be missing from the perspective of my students, at least, is a conspiracy theory used to explain this grand level of Jewish wealth or a revolutionary agenda to redistribute this supposed Jewish wealth. The realities of economic inequality do not appear to trouble the majority of my students who are as capitalist and materialistic as most North Americans today, but they do see economics as the general source of resentment against Jews in contemporary culture, and one can imagine where their thinking might lead if they felt differently about the nature of society given these problematic assumptions. In general, I sense in my students both a legitimate curiosity and a near total ignorance about Jews and Judaism, rather than any systematic hostility. Part of this curiosity, however, appears to be connected to a kind of bewilderment at the general hostility directed toward Jews in the world today, especially via the internet. They wonder why the Jewish, which is how they often refer to Jews, instinctually feeling that uh, the word Jew is derogatory. And they go to, as I say in a footnote here, go to great grammatical lengths to avoid the word. They don't want to be insulting, which should tell us something about the effects on language of anti-Semitism. They wonder why the Jewish, as many of my students refer to Jews, are hated by so many people in so many different places. Why are there so many attacks on Jews and Judaism on the internet? And why did Hitler, quote, try to wipe them out, end quote? The sense here is that there must be something wrong with the Jews if, somebody, if, if everyone hates them to such an extent. My sense is that this troubling assumption, one, uh, by the way, on which anti-Semitism feeds, could be the impetus for their interest in the subject in the first place. Regardless of their level of exposure to Christianity, students begin the course with little awareness of the religious conflict between Judaism and Christianity or of the discriminatory practices and anti-Jewish legislation resulting from the hateful teachings of Christian theology and its pre proponents throughout the ages. And without any knowledge of this religious historical foundation, students have no understanding of the hostile and exclusionary context that determines the increasing de Jewish dependence upon usury and money occupations in the European Middle Ages. And again, without an understanding of the historical construction of the so-called rich Jew mythology in Western history, my students simply continue to accept and reproduce this deeply embedded cultural stereotype, albeit with little apparent personal resentment. If these students have any knowledge of the subject matter, the focus, it seems, is on Nazi racism rather than on European forms of anti-Semitism. This is confirmed by their astonishment at the fact that everything Hitlerism did to the Jewish people, with the exception of murdering them en masse in industrialized killing centers, was already on the books of European Christian history, and much of it legislated by canon law. Part of the explanation for their familiarity with National Socialism is not simply that it is the result of Holocaust education, but that it is another disturbing example of the undying fa fascination with Hitler and with Nazism, and thereby 
may not reflect any real interest in Jews at all or any concern for their fate under Nazism. Ideological equality and historical homogeneity. Another cultural current I've witnessed in class and elsewhere is a tendency for people to freely compare anti-Semitism to any and all forms of bias or prejudice, and the Holocaust to any and all acts of violence in contemporary culture and human history. In Canada, one of the current problems under discussion is the history of residential schools, which were established by the government in the 19th century and administered by the Catholic, Anglican, United, and Presbyterian churches until 1969, when the government again assumed control until 1996, when the last school was closed. These schools, numbering 130 in all, institutionalized 150,000 Aboriginal, Métis, and Inuit children, taking them away from their families and communities, banning their traditions, suppressing their languages, in the effort to, quote, civilize these children, or more accurately, to force their assimilation into Canadian society. Additionally, there was a high level, a very high level, of physical abuse and sexual molestation experienced by these children at the hands of priests and nuns, and this has resulted in an enormous amount of psychological and physiological damage, largely through alcohol and drug addiction, to Aboriginal families and to their communities. And some now refer to this period of Aboriginal history in Canada as the Canadian Holocaust. I have observed that those who compare anti-Semitism indiscriminately to other forms of prejudice and the Holocaust to any violent event in human history know very little about the events they compare and next to nothing about the specific history and nature of anti-Semitism or the Holocaust. They assume, assume that the similarities between violent, disparate historical events far outweigh their differences, largely because human beings are involved and we are now thought to be more alike than different. Very often these comparisons are reduced to the common theme of human suffering anyway, which few of us really want to try to compare. While there are certainly basic similarities in all violence and criminality, I would like to suggest that studying Canadian residential schools to understand Auschwitz is just about as useful as studying the history of anti-Semitism in order to understand the dispossession and destruction of indigenous populations in the Americas. But this is precisely the point. These comparisons have very little to do with the goals of scholarship or any concern for historical accuracy. Instead, they reflect our contemporary cultural obsession with equality and inclusion. It is surely one of the ironies of the post-Holocaust period that Holocaust education helped to create our current obsession with racism and its antidote of equality. And it is this obsession that too often eclipses anti-Semitism and disfigures the Holocaust. Comparison, or more accurately, equation, allows people to ally difference and to amalgamate all human suffering and therefore build solidarity between people. How can anyone argue with such a humane agenda? However, as a historian, one wonders what exactly is similar about residential schools designed to forcibly assimilate Aboriginal children into Canadian society, that is, to quote, kill the Indian and save the child, end quote, and Nazi death camps designed to gas and burn an entire people conceived of as a racial bacillus. In the final analysis, these phenomena actually share very little in common. In fact, what their comparison does illustrate very clearly is the categorical difference between the nature and operation of Canadian colonial racism and that of homicidal Nazi antisemitism. But these are differences, and differences violate the spirit of the entire comparative enterprise. Perhaps historians obsessed as we are with cultural and temporal specificity are ill-equipped for such an endeavor. However, this impetus for human homogene homogenization appears to be very popular with many people, even some historians. Several years ago, the chair of the history department in which I was teaching told me in no uncertain terms that the Holocaust should be taught comparatively. Afterward, I wondered why a Canadian labor historian should have such strong feelings about the nature and contours of my field, anti-Semitism and the Holocaust, and why he should feel so empowered and tell me, to tell me how to teach a course in my specific area of specialization. I would never do this, right, in reverse. I would have nothing to say about how to teach Canadian labor history. 
This experience led me to wonder why it is that after only two decades of existence, the academic field of Holocaust studies is under pressure to abandon its particularism and take its rightful place in comparative genocide studies, especially given the fact that were it not for the Holocaust, there would be no legal concept of genocide in the first place. No doubt this pressure is the product of a generally humane attempt to represent and unify all the victims of history, but it is also the result of our society's general ignorance about the unique nature of anti-Semitism and the central role it plays in racism generally and in Nazism in particular. There is also, however, a darker aspect to this problem. The persistence of anti-Semitic ideas about Jews in Western culture, albeit in forms that are invisible to most people. For many people in post-Holocaust Western culture, Jews continue to be perceived as clannish and selfish and obsessed with their own suffering. And it seems that Holocaust education is increasingly resented as another example of these so-called Jewish tendencies. And this has only exacerbated anti-Jewish attitudes in some quarters. In the world today, Jews are generally per not perceived as victims, except perhaps during the Holocaust, but then they are often casually placed among Hitler's other victims, the Roma and Sinti peoples, Slavs, the disabled, gays and lesbians, political and religious dissenters of all sorts, and anyone else harassed by the regime. Instead, Jews are perceived largely as a people with financial, political, and military power over others who are the actual victims of so-called Jewish interests. This perception, however, is not new, but is a common theme in the history of anti-Semitism. Regardless of their actual individual circumstances in Western societies, Jews have always been perceived collectively as having powerful resources, connections, and an uncanny ability to harm society. Rather than as victims, Jews have been perceived by the West as victimizers, beginning with their so-called murder of Jesus Christ, which of course provided the initial template and set this theme into action. Unfortunately, too many people assume that the Holocaust eliminated anti-Semitism from our culture, root and branch. And they also assume that anti-Semitism is restricted to the Western world, and that what we are witnessing in other regions of the globe is simply anger directed toward Israel for the plight of the Palestinians. For many people today who know very little about the history of anti-Semitism, its permutations and combinations, the phenomenon is defined strictly in Hitlerian terms, so that unless one is calling for the destruction of the Jewish people, one is not really an anti-Semite. Even calling for the destruction of the Jewish state does not necessarily qualify one as an anti-Semite today, because the call targets Israelis instead of Jews, and some see this so-called emancipatory call as a legitimate form of progressive politics. Today, historians talk about taboos against anti-Semitism thought to have come into existence after World War II. Perhaps it is time for a culturally specific historical analysis of these purported taboos and a proper scholarly evaluation of their cultural significance as a method of covering up the continued existence of anti-Semitic attitudes based upon unyielding beliefs about Jews by suppressing their public expression. Certainly taboos were not produced in Eastern Europe, or in the Middle East, or even in parts of Western and Southern Europe. The taboos of post-war West Germany were official in nature and based upon the self-interested attempt of Germans and their government to re-enter the family of nations after their totally outrageous assault on humanity. Even the belief that Germans suppressed their memories of Nazism and its anti-Semitism in the first decades after the war has come under increased scrutiny scrutiny by historians. In fact, the belief that Jews were continuing to harm Germany with their Holocaust obsession, funneled now through American culture, was common and facilitated forms, additional forms of German anti-Semitism. Variations on this theme exist across post-war Europe, especially in the Soviet republics of Poland and Ukraine. A study of these taboos and their function in post-war societies will call into question the widely held assumption that Auschwitz cured the West of its anti-Semitism. Invisible anti-Semitism. Is it familiarity or indifference that produces invi invisibility? In the case of anti-Semitism, it may be both. One of the reasons why people today reject the charge of anti-Semitism is because, as mentioned, it is largely defined by Auschwitz in the Western imagination. If one is not prepared to physically attack or attempt to harm Jews, one can safely remain aloof to the charge of anti-Semitism. In Western culture, 
the beliefs many people still hold about the Jews are seen to be are not seen to be anti-Semitic, read genocidal, but are simply felt to be reflective of day-to-day -day reality. In other words, what some of us identify as anti-Semitic ways of thinking, most people see as simply reflective of a reality in which the Jews are in fact wealthy, in fact powerful, in fact connected to one another, and in fact working together, another word, another phrase for conspiring, to protect their own communal and individual interests, which today of course include the fate of the state of Israel. Again, this is not new, but fully consistent with classical forms of European anti-Semitism, in which anti-Semites point to reality to illustrate Jewish power, conspiracy, materialism, criminality, or whatever negative association they want to affix to the Jews. And the reality they find then confirms the pre-existing anti-Semitism as it does today. After almost 2,000 years of indoctrination, which has worked very hard to fix the Western imagination and our individual attention upon this abstraction, this abstract collective called the Jews, we should not be surprised to discover that Western culture is riddled with anti-Semitic perceptions and habits of thought about the Jewish people. And this complex invisible reality has not been exercised by the Holocaust. Negative beliefs and attitudes about Jews are so normal, they are so ingrained in Western perceptions and attitudes that people, both Gentiles and Jews, are simply unable to recognize them for what they are. Like a second skin, anti-Semitic thinking has become invisible to many people. Very much like sexism in our current culture, anti-Semitism is minimized and ignored and generally presented as a problem of the past. This dynamic in the treatment of contemporary sexism was clearly evident in the recent Democratic and Republican primary campaigns and in their coverage by the press. As demonstrated by those working in the print and electronic media, both women and men engage in this process of denial and obfuscation when it comes to addressing sexism, and they do so for a number of political and personal reasons. Similarly, Jews and non-Jews jointly participate in the current attempt to discount and suppress the legitimate discussion of anti-Semitism as a serious problem, animating far too many discussions of Zionism and the state of Israel in the West, in so-called progressive circles, in the media and in the Islamic world. Here there are no doubt personal and political motives at work as well. For women and Jews, one might argue that they deny the existence of sexism and anti-Semitism respectively in the attempt to protect themselves both psychologically by denying the threat against them in the first place, and also by aligning themselves with the dominant culture of denial, and then enjoying a privileged place within it. Certainly, women who deny the persistence of sexism are as valuable to the dominant culture as are Jews who deny the ongoing existence of anti-Semitism. Both are used as evidence of the lack of sexism and anti-Semitism at work in our culture. This again is not new in the history of anti-Semitism. Jewish converts to Christianity, the more prominent the better, were used in this way to confirm the truth of the gospel for centuries. Some Jewish conversions were so valuable to the church that the Pope himself officiated. And these new Christians, fluent in Hebrew and Talmud, were then employed against their brethren in formal public disputations against Judaism, and in the many trials that consigned the Talmud to the flames. A striking example of overt anti-Semitism, given wide coverage on American media and yet entirely invisible to the broadcaster, the reporter, and the public, was the <coughs> so-called Obama ghost, which aired on American news on the 16th of October 2008 during the Democratic primary campaign. And there is an image, I have three screenshots from YouTube um, that, that were passed around. Um, you might want to take a look at those images. The first one is of the Obama ghost. The second one makes uh, um, it clear that there is a Magan David on the head of the ghost. And uh, the third one shows the very obvious SS uh, insignia that's used to spell uh, Barack uh, Obama's name, middle name, Hussein, uh, and incorrectly at that, as, as we are very familiar with, with anti-Semites, which for some reason can't spell 
A man named Mike Lunsford from Fairfield City, Ohio, had a Barack Obama ghost hanging from a tree in front of his house. When asked about the ghost, he stated that this was not a political statement. He just did not want an African-American president. Obviously, Lunsford was offering the public a symbolic Halloween lynching of Barack Obama. What went entirely unmentioned, however, was the Magan David painted on the head of the Obama ghost and the SS symbolism spelled in rune font used to spell Obama's middle name, Hussein. No one in the video commented on this. Mike Lunsford was not asked to explain it, nor did the news anchor who introduced the story address the obvious anti-Semitism involved. It appeared to be completely invisible and obviously irrelevant to one and all. For a culture supposedly inundated with Holocaust education and memorialization, people use the word obsessed with the Holocaust, America is obsessed, uh, as the United States is often characterized, this lapse of recognition strikes one as really rather odd. With reflection, however, this example is deeply troubling for what it reveals about our contemporary blindness when it comes to anti-Semitism and our lack of understanding about the key role it plays in facilitating other forms of racism. This example reveals a cultural fixation on violence against African Americans, which is of course one of the central traumas of American history, but it also reveals a total indifference toward anti-Semitism. Anyone familiar with the rhetoric of neo-Nazi racism knows that, quote, the Jews are responsible for orchestrating race mixing and the democratic liberation of minorities as part of their conspiracy to weaken white America and bring about its collapse. This is obviously a clear application of Hitlerian thought to the American homeland. All the anti-Semite has to do to prove this conspiracy is to point to David Axelrod as the Jewish mastermind behind the rise of Barack Obama, as of course the the Nazi, neo-Nazi movements are doing as we speak online. <coughs> Lunsford's use of Nazi SS symbolism no doubt reflects his familiarity with contemporary American racist movements which continue to advocate their Hitlerian mission. It is the Jew, not African Americans or any other minority for that matter, who forms the central threat against the white race, according to these groups. And I have race in quotation marks. The world's ethnic and religious minorities and any emancipatory movement that advances their cause are the vehicles through which the Jewish conspiracy operates. I would suggest that this example illustrates three cultural tendencies all at once. The first is our general Western fixation on racism, which is a product, in fact, of the post-Holocaust period. Secondly, our culturally induced indifference toward anti-Semitism. And third, our ignorance of the centrally determinative role played by anti-Semitism in the racist imagination. Anti-Semitism, the classic and the contemporary. With our cultural and scholarly focus now firmly established upon Islamic anti-Semitism and the so-called new forms of this hatred, we are perhaps forgetting or ignoring the fact that classic forms of anti-Semitism continue to persist and are being reinvigorated by contemporary variations. From the 12th to the 18th of October 2008 at Parkway West Middle School in Chesterfield, St. Louis, Missouri, sixth grade students enjoyed what they called Spirit Week. This rather benign and inclusive, although obviously Christian-inspired week, began with Hug a Friend Day. It moved on to High Five Day, quickly reversed course with Hit a Tall Person Day, and finally devolved into Hit a Jew Day. According to news reports, 10 out of 35 Jewish students were hit on their backs and one in the face during this Spirit Week Day. This is obviously a deeply troubling episode in American culture, not least for the kids, the children, and the families targeted by this ritual. If nothing else, it reveals, again, a total lack of cultural awareness about anti-Semitism. It may also manifest the more familiar anti-Semitic theme of the Jew as an abstraction, as opposed to a real existing human being. However, to properly evaluate this possibility, we would have to investigate whether any non-Jewish children were also assaulted. It is telling, however, that there was no hit a Chinese person day or hit a black person day or hit a girl day, although one can imagine that these were in the pipeline had this school ritual continued. The question that we should be asking is why in 2008 in Chesterfield, Missouri, a suburban upper middle class community of west of St. Louis, the first ethnic group, ethnic minority group targeted for physical abuse by a group of sixth graders were Jews. 
The official response to this eruption of violent anti-Semitism was not to teach the children or the larger community that socializes them about the specific history of anti-Semitism, but to have the kids study the Holocaust later that year. This would allow teachers to convert this experience into teachable moments, as teachers refer to them, using well-established forms of anti-bias education and diversity training. Last year at the University of North Dakota, aviation student Scott Leibovitz was targeted as a Jew and harassed by fellow students and residents. In addition to swastikas being painted in the dormitory stairwell, Leibovitz was taunted, chased, and threatened with a pellet gun. Finally, Scott is a Jew who was smeared in ice cream on the elevator door in his dorm. After the staff and residential services refused to register Leibovitz's first complaint, and the university administration ignored the anti-Semitic nature of his harassment, the Jewish Students' Organization on campus took their cause to the media. These students number between 15 and 20 out of a total population of 13,000 students, the vast majority of whom are Christian and have a European heritage. In addition to its troubled history with the Aboriginal peoples of this region over the ongoing use of the offensive fighting Sioux mascot, UND is also famous for its acceptance of $100 million in 1990 from casino mogul and alumnus Ralph Engelstadt. Despite the fact that he had a photograph of Hitler in his office and was known to celebrate the German dictator's birthday. In a recent interview with the forward UND professor of philosophy Jack Weinstein admitted that he can no longer quote in good conscience encourage Jewish students to come to UND end quote. These two examples occurred in American educational environments, precisely the place where many assume anti-Semitism no longer exists. Is it possible that both Jews and Gentiles, albeit for different reasons, have become immune to specific forms of Western anti-Semitism? Have we simply accepted certain types of anti-Semitic attitudes and dynamics as normal in Western culture? Is there so much anti-Semitism present in the world that our attention and resources have to be directed toward only the most radical forms? One of the problems facing scholars today is this current conception of anti-Semitism as old and new. Old anti-Semitism is precisely the type discussed in this paper which many assume no longer exists in post-Holocaust Western culture. New anti-Semitism is believed to be that emanating from the Islamic world, including its European diaspora, and the so-called progressive end of the political spectrum worldwide, despite the fact that both of these forms have well-worn histories of their own. This inaccurate conception of old and new anti-Semitism leads to a minimization, or outright elision, of already existing anti-Semitism, which never passed away after the Holocaust, and it blinds us to the connective ties that continue to exist between classic and contemporary forms of anti-Semitism. We know that Christian anti-Semitism was imported into every region of the world dominated by European powers beginning in the 15th century and continuing for hundreds of years thereafter. Scholars like Matthias Kunzel and Jeffrey Herf are currently investigating the contemporary implications of the very conscious Nazi strategy to export their own version of homicidal anti-Semitism into the Middle East. The anti-Semitic fruit of these two European trees planted abroad is now being imported into the West via the internet. There now appears to be a conscientious strategy on the part of contemporary anti-Semites in the Islamic world to build an alliance with the West against the Jews. In fact, the non-Western reading of Western anti-Semitism, which is obviously millennial and culturally comprehensive in nature, empowers these individuals to use this strategy in their war against Israel. Their strategy is to weaken the relationship between the Western nations and the state of Israel and between Jews and their non-Jewish neighbors in the West by reactivating the anti-Semitic animus in Western culture. Ahmadinejad is the most obvious exemplar of this conscious strategy and his recent address to the UN General Assembly betrays as much. And here I'll quote from his address. The dignity, integrity, and rights of the American and European people are being played with by a small but deceitful number of people called Zionists. Although they are a minuscule minority, they have been dominating an important portion of the financial and monetary centers, as well as the political decision-making centers of some European countries and the US in a deceitful, complex, and furtive manner. It is deeply disastrous to witness that some presidential or premier nominees 
in some big countries have to visit these people, take part in their gatherings, swear their allegiance and commitment to their interests in order to attain financial or media support. This means that the great people of America and various nations of Europe need to obey the demands and wishes of a small number of acquisitive and invasive people. These nations are spending their dignity and resources on the crimes and occupations and the threats of the Zionist network against their will." End quote. In the Western world, the Jews have for millennia been demonized collectively and conceptualized as nihilistic operatives working against the goals of humanity, whether defined as Christian, enlightened, proletarian, or even Aryan. The Jews have been associated in the most concrete and abstract ways with every conceivable form of evil known to Western culture. Killing God in the form of Jesus, kidnapping, torturing, and killing children, poisoning, cheating, and conspiring against their neighbors, cannibalism, blood drinking, devil worship, human sacrifice, every form of disloyalty to the state, extortion, blackmail, and all types of financial crime. One can only imagine. This is precisely the context that invented and maintained the lie of the worldwide Jewish conspiracy, which in turn produced the Hitlerian solution to that conspiracy. And both have been exported around the world. What is so extremely disturbing about Ahmadinejad's rhetoric and many others who echo him is its classic anti-Semitic depiction of the Jews here in the contemporary form of Zionists as operating outside the values and interests of common humanity and all that is good. Worse still is the fact that this seems to go unnoticed by the vast majority of people in Western nations, including otherwise progressive academics and members of government. Few seem to notice that the West is being courted by Ahmadinejad to be recruited into his global anti-Semitic strategy under the banner of humanistic inclusion and spiritual redemption. Quote, again from his speech, let us hand in hand expand the thought of resistance against evil and the minority of those who are ill-wishers. Let's support goodness and the majority of people who are good and the embodiment of absolute good that is the imam of time, the promised one, who will come accompanied by Jesus Christ and accordingly design and implement the just and humanistic mechanisms for regulating the constructive relationships between nations and governments. O oh, great almighty, deliver, notice he does not use the word Allah. O oh, great almighty, deliver the savior of nations and put an end to the sufferings of mankind and bring forth justice, beauty, and love." End quote. The leader of Iran is making headway in this strategy. This past December, Britain's Channel 4 gave Ahmadinejad the honor of delivering their so-called alternative Christi Christmas message, stating with characteristic Western democratic aplomb, quote, we are offering our viewers an insight into an alternative worldview, end quote. For those of us who study anti-Semitism, we know that his views are not quite alternative enough, but are fairly far too common these days. Those familiar with his strategy to unite the Islamic and Christian or formerly Christian worlds against the Jews see this small Christmas coup as a victory for him and a serious defeat for us. For those who dismiss Christian anti-Semitism as a thing of the past, two immediate examples of its continued presence and influence, however muted, should act as a corrective. The first is an unrepentant Bill Moyers who recently characterized the Israeli assault on Gaza as an example of, quote, gen genetically coded Jewish violence, using the book of Deuteronomy as his Christian proof text. The second example is the Pope's recent rehabilitation of an anti-Semitic British bishop who is also a Holocaust denier. Leaving aside the problem that this German Pope was a member of the Hitler Youth and that this should have disqualified him automatically from becoming Christ's vicar on earth, the fact that Richard Williamson's anti-Semitism went unnoticed by the Vatican in their reassessment of this man's renovation as bishop, the Pope claims not to have known about his views, reveals a disturbing level of anti-Semitism or tolerance thereof in the institution most responsible for it in the first place, as well as an astonishing indifference to the Catholic relationship with the Jewish people. <laughs>
Given Ahmadinejad's terrible strategy, the lack of Western engagement with the subject of anti-Semitism, and the resulting ignorance as to the specific nature, history, and ongoing presence in Western culture is cause for worry and remains a serious problem that requires our scholarly attention. Oh, I hear you. Part two, can I, can I continue? Is that right? Okay, because this is an important part. Part two. Holocaust universalization and the persistence of anti-Semitism. Apparently, we live in a world that is obsessed with the Holocaust, obsessed with anti-Semitism and Jewish suffering, a world that restricts all negative discussion about Jews and the state of Israel and censors itself out of the fear of being branded anti-Semitic. The reality, I'm afraid, is actually the reverse. We live in a world that knows next to nothing about the reality of the Nazi final solution to the Jewish question. A world that cares little about the problem of anti-Semitism and the effects of its lies and libels upon Jews and, our, on, and on our larger society because it has not been forced to confront it in any serious and sustained way. With a few exceptions, our world is a world that knows little about the history of Jewish suffering which has been understood by Christians traditionally as a divinely inspired punishment anyway, and cares even less about the suffering of strangers. Far from restricting negative discussion about Jews and Israel, our world is increasingly demonizing and delegitimizing the Jewish state and its people in its attempt to force a solution to the crisis in the Middle East. And instead of self-censoring, people simply now deny and dismiss the label anti-Semite out of hand, thereby erasing the phenomenon as a serious contemporary problem and reenacting the Western failure to honestly confront and exercise its own anti-Semitic demons. How is all of this possible after decades of exposure to the Holocaust through education in schools and universities, the production of countless Holocaust histories and memoirs, the wide distribution of Holocaust-related films, plays, and television programs, the construction of Holocaust memorials, including a prominent federal institution in Washington? How do we explain the apparent paradox of a culture that appears to be suffering from Holocaust fatigue, so much so that there is growing resentment against the subject and its memorialization, and yet knows very little about the event itself and the pivotal role played by anti-Semitism in its conception and execution? To answer the question, we must begin to examine the history of Holocaust education and try to assess exactly what people have learned about the Holocaust and anti-Semitism over the last several decades. Part of the answer can be found in the material used to teach the subject. The two central texts used by teachers and parents and professors to educate students about the Holocaust are the Diary of Anne Frank and Ali Wiesel's Night. Each book records the experience of a child and early adolescent during the years of the Holocaust. One, of, one in the occupied Netherlands and the other in Romania, which becomes Hungary as of August 1940, and later Auschwitz. Both books have been celebrated for decades, but also criticized for their universalization and not so subtle elision of the Jewish experience under Nazism. This is especially so in the case of the Diary of Anne Frank, translated into the first published in Dutch in 1947, immediately after the war, translated into French and German in 1950, into English in 1952, and then you had a play staged on Broadway only three years later. Instead of discussing the long and detailed controversies over the book and its theatrical applications, this section will examine several trenchant tech critiques of the text that deserve our renewed attention. In 1960, Bruno Bettelheim wrote a psychosocial critique of the Broadway play and the Hollywood film, which came out in 1959 for Harper's Magazine, in which he focused his intention not so much on Anne's text, but on our use of it and our reaction to it. For Bethelheim, the larger culture's universal and uncritical response to the diary reflects, quote, our wish to forget the gas chambers, end quote, and instead take comfort in the false belief that Jews could retreat, quote, into an extremely private, gentle, sensitive world, despite being surrounded by a maelstrom apt to engulf one at any moment, end quote. Even more offensive is our fetishized treatment of her famous statement, in spite of everything, I still believe that people are good at heart, to which the story is often reduced. 
when in fact Anne had written those optimistic words well before the attic had been sold out by a Dutch informant for about a dollar per person, the inhabitants deported to the camps, her mother killed, and she and her sister Margaret suffered abject death by typhus in Bergen-Belsen in April 1945. This lesson about the goodness of people, given the actual history of, the, of Anne Frank and her family, is patently false, and Bettelheim believes that it creates an equally false sense of optimism, misleading readers to imagine Anne surviving the war. And in fact, recent pedagogical studies of the diary have demonstrated just this. Students have been shown to characterize Anne's diary as, quote, more hopeful than sad, end quote, as a story of survival, even a love story. They appear to manifest a deep-seated resistance to the truth of her death in Bergen-Belsen, which was described by one young man as ruining the story for him. Bettelheim also argues that the platitude about human goodness, quote, releases us effectively of the need to cope with the problems Auschwitz presents, end quote. Now, writing in 1960, he does not mention anti-Semitism specifically, nor does he characterize the specific problems Auschwitz presents. But today, we know that without Auschwitz, without anti-Semitism, there would not have been an Auschwitz. And yet, the diary allows its readers to disregard this reality entirely. Here, then, is a perfect example of the way students and the larger culture are exposed to the Holocaust and yet learn nothing. <coughs> in particular about the problem of anti-Semitism. Lawrence Langer makes an important observation about the book in this regard. Instead of providing any actual information about the Holocaust or anti-Semitism, Langer argues, the diary, quote, enacts in its very text a designed avoidance of the very experience it is reputed to grant us some exposure to. And thus her work helps us to transcend what we have not yet encountered, nonetheless leaving behind a film of conviction that we have." End quote. Powerful. And it is this false conviction that both impedes a cultural engagement with anti-Semitism and, as we shall see, actually reproduces it, reproduces anti-Semitism in relation to Israel. In a devastating critique by Cynthia Ozick, the diary is described as bodlerized, distorted, transmuted, traduced, reduced, infantilized, Americanized, homogenized, sentimentalized, falsified, kitschified, and in fact, blatantly and arrogantly denied. Like Bettelheim and Langer, Ozick denies the value of this text as a Holocaust document. To make her point, she proceeds to reconstruct the actual fate of the front girls based upon the testimony of Belsen survivors, including Anne's schoolmate, Hannah Gosler. Quote, Margaret fell dead to, the, dead to the ground from the wooden slab on which she lay, eaten by lice, and Anne, heartbroken and skeletal, naked under a bit of rag, died a day or two later, end quote. Equally important to Ozick's graphic truth-telling is her revelation of the very real dejudaization of this book, revealed by the publication in 1995 of additional diary material that had been removed by her father, Otto, subsequent publishers and translators. Comparing editions now reveals that Otto Frank removed Anne's numerous references to Judaism, including those describing Yom Kippur. Additionally, the Zionism of Anne's sister, Margaret, as well as the Hebrew the family sung at Hanukkah were deleted from the Hackett Broadway script approved by her father. Editions that distort Anne's story were invented by producer Lillian Hellman, who inserted lines like, quote, We're not the only people that have had to suffer. There have always been people that have had to, sometimes one race, sometimes another, end quote. Even worse, perhaps, Otto Frank allowed the translator of the German edition, Anneliese Schutz, to either remove or revise Anne's passages about Germans. For example, in her list of house rules, some of you may remember them, Anne writes, Use of language. It is necessary to speak softly at all times. Only the language of civilized people may be spoken. Thus, no German. The German translation reads, Alle Kultursprachen, aber leise. All civilized languages, but softly. Schutz justified her methods of distortion and exculpation as necessary because a book, quote, for sale in Germany, cannot abuse the Germans, end quote. Ozick tells us that a German drama critic admitted that the theatrical version of the diary allowed Germans to, quote, see our own fate 
the tragedy of human existence per se, end quote. And so as Alvin Rosenfeld has observed, Anne Frank has become a ready-to-hand formula for easy forgiveness, and of all things, as Ozick says, a vehicle of German communal identification. One is reminded of Theodore Adorno's discussion of a German woman who left the play in 1959 saying, quote, yes, but really at least that girl ought to have been allowed to live, end quote. The fact that Adorno characterizes this disgusting remark as a first step toward insight, for which he appears to be grateful, illustrates the pervasive anti-Semitism in post-war German culture and the ongoing complicity of Germans in these crimes as late as 14 years after the war. It would not be until 1991 that Germans would have the opportunity to discover the original content of Anne's diary. Ozick describes Otto Frank in what are thought to be typically German-Jewish terms, secular, assimilated, and bourgeois, but also accommodating, even deferential in relation to Gentiles and especially toward Germans. She interprets his primary role in distorting the diary of Anne Frank as the result of his social need to please his environment and not to offend it. It has always been and remains today safer for Jews to avoid confronting Gentiles about their anti-Semitism. And this reality, Ozick argues, is what led him to speak of goodness rather than about destruction, and to allow the diary to become accommodated to expressions like man's inhumanity to man, diluting and befogging specific historical events and their motives. Furthermore, the memorial he chose to honor his daughter was the Anne Frank Foundation, an international youth center, both located in Anne Frank House in Amsterdam. Ozick argues that this memorial, dedicated to the humanistic goal of bringing young people across the globe into contact with one another, nevertheless washed away into do-gooder abstraction, the explicit urge to rage that had devoured his daughter. Here she is referring explicitly to Anne's diary entry from May 3rd, 1944. There is a destructive urge in people, the urge to rage, to murder, and to kill. Obviously, our choice to ignore these words and fetishize their very opposite, and then to present our choice as the epitome of Anne Frank and her experience says more about the problematic needs of Western culture than anything else. One can see how truly offensive and deceitful this cultural fetish is when the lines immediately following Anne's comments about human goodness read, quote, I simply can't build up my hopes on a foundation consisting of confusion, misery, and death. I see the world gradually being turned into a wilderness. I hear the ever-approaching thunder which will destroy us too. I can feel the suffering of millions, end quote. Our misuse of her words is actually perverse, as suggested by Griselda Pollock, in that we make the victim herself provide bystanders and even perpetrators with comfort in our distress at encountering her suffering. Do I have time to talk about night? Yes? Okay, I know, I'm sorry, it's already an hour. Um, the second Holocaust text used in the classroom is night. Elie Wiesel's memoir of his experience as a young Hasidic boy in Sigit, Romania, the destruction of his family and his community, his struggle to survive in Auschwitz, and the liberation of Buchenwald. The book was first published in French in 1958 with the help of French Catholic writer Francois Moriac and translated into English two years later. Despite the fact that the Jewish child in this text is Hasidic and therefore less familiar to readers than the more assimilated Anne of the diary, the major trope of night is nonetheless universal, the collapse of faith in a god who can no longer possibly exist after Auschwitz. Moreover, the book is Christological in places, such as the image of the hanging Jewish boy in Auschwitz, which serves to make the text accessible and meaningful to a Christian audience. Mark Anderson interprets this Christology as a conscious strategy with problematic implications. Evoking Christ's crucifixion even as it denies the existence of God, Wiesel's account of Auschwitz turns into a religious drama accessible to all readers, Jews and Christians. It becomes a moral tale about the sanctity of angelic children rather than a historical meditation on Nazi crimes and Gentile complicity. Like the Diary of Anne Frank, we now know that there's an earlier version of this text too, which is not dominated by universal themes, but articulates a Jewish point of view that is justifiably furious at the non-Jewish world. Elie Wiesel wrote an 800-page manuscript in Yiddish, 
immediately <coughs> after the war, and 250 pages of it were published under the title Und die Welt hat geschwiegen, and the world kept silent, in 1956 in Buenos Aires. In this earlier text, Wiesel describes the Jewish context of his childhood in elaborate detail, but he also conveys the realities of Jewish rage and the desire for revenge. In her study of the two Wiesel texts, Naomi Zeidman explains that instead of the absence of vengeful thoughts in night, the Yiddish version states that, quote, newly liberated Jewish boys ran off to Weimar to steal clothing and potatoes and to rape German girls, end quote. There is also additional material at the end of the text, non-existent in night, which conveys Wiesel's anger and frustration at the anti-Semitic continuity of post-war Europe. Quote, now 10 years after Buchenwald, I see that the world is forgetting. Germany is a sovereign state. The German army has been reborn. The bestial sadist of Buchenwald, Ilse Koch, is happily raising her children. War criminals stroll the streets of Hamburg and Munich. The past has been erased forgotten. Germans and anti-Semites persuade the world that the, the story of the six million Jewish martyrs is a fantasy and the naive world will probably believe them, if not today, then tomorrow or the next day. So I thought it would be a good idea to publish a book based on the notes I wrote in Buchenwald. I am not so naive to believe that a book will change history or shake people's beliefs. Books no longer have the power they once had. Those who were silent yesterday will also be silent tomorrow. This, unfortunately, is not the Ali Wiesel the world has come to know. This Jewish survivor who accuses Europe of complicity and condemns a silent world, Zeidman argues, was supplanted by the French Catholic survivor haunted by metaphysics and silence. And so, as with Frank, Anne Frank's diary, the specificity of Jewish experience, an experience that is specifically determined by anti-Semitism, is sacrificed to the wants and needs of the dominant Gentile world. And what is worse, the Jewish survivor is then co-opted by his surrounding Christian culture as a potent emblem of martyrdom, of suffering silence, thereby enacting and reinforcing a tradition responsible for anti-Semitism in the first place. In conclusion, this essay has tried to suggest that the primary Holocaust texts used to teach the subject both universalize and Christianize the experience of Jewish suffering in an attempt to make the subject matter accessible and meaningful to non-Jews. This was perceived as necessary after the war due to the anti-Semitic nature of post-war Western culture. There was a general hope, however, that non-Jews would learn, would somehow imbibe that anti-Semitism was wrong from reading these stories and eventually from a curriculum that focused on the general evils of discrimination and racism and promoted a doctrine of universal human rights. Today, Holocaust education forms the basis for a new type of civic education. Instead of learning about the nation, our provinces, or states, or even one city, young people learn about war and genocide, and increasingly in a comparative framework, and the new civic values of peaceful re reconciliation and human rights. In countries like Canada and the United States, this also presents an opportunity to celebrate ourselves in the form of the American Constitution, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and our allied role in liberating Europe from Hitler. This is precisely the conclusion that is presented in the permanent exhibit of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and it is the basis for the conception of the new Canadian Museum for Human Rights, scheduled to open in Winnipeg in 2012. By the way, that began as a Holocaust museum. It is now a human rights museum. There is no doubt that Holocaust education has had a positive influence on Western society. It has helped to create our contemporary concern with fighting racism and promoting human rights, and it has generated our current interest in the historical and contemporary problems of genocide and of war crimes. The problem, however, is that it has not produced a corresponding concern about anti-Semitism, and this has created serious problems for the state of Israel and for Jews worldwide. What we have produced in contemporary Western culture is a general conviction, to use Langer's term, that we've learned the lessons of the Holocaust, when in fact few people outside the academic field know anything about the Nazi final solution, its systematic destruction of Jewish Europe, and the nature and history of the anti-Semitism responsible for this catastrophe, which persists into our own time. This paradoxical reality 
has a detrimental effect on Western culture and on our role in contemporary politics. Academic and popular discussions of the ongoing war in the Middle East are increasingly dominated by a human rights ideology, which is understood to rest upon the universal lessons of the Holocaust, but lacks an equal interest in and attention to the problem of anti-Semitism, which is in fact fueling the conflict. The widespread and willful denial of the key role played by anti-Semitism in this conflict, both in animating the Arab and Muslim war against Israel, and then in provoking an aggressive, defensive Israeli response, guarantees that the cycle of killing will continue. By erasing anti-Semitism from the equation of the Middle East and refusing to understand and accept the effects of the Shoah on the people of Israel and on Jews in general, both the Western and the Islamic worlds will continue to demonize Israel as violently irrational and inhumanly cruel. And they will also be responsible for helping to prolong this terrible conflict. Moreover, the human rights under discussion in this conflict are increasingly identified as Palestinian instead of civilian, which again manifests the anti-Semitic impulse of excluding Jews from common humanity. Lacking an adequate knowledge about the nature and history of anti-Semitism and of the Nazi final solution to the Jewish question, people make and accept facile and deeply offensive equations between Israel and Nazi Germany and dismiss the ferocious anti-Semitism of the Arab and Muslim worlds as merely righteous anger at the Israeli violation of their human rights. And so, in what can only be characterized as a tragically ironic development, Contemporary hostility against Israel is furtherly, further legitimized by a growing perception that Jews, of all people, have failed to learn the universal lessons of their own Holocaust. And for this, Jews are once again guilty, collectively, for advancing their own particularism in violation of this new universal religion of humanity. Given this current scenario, one wonders if Holocaust survivors and the others involved in creating public Holocaust education would agree with Cynthia Ozick, who suggested at the end of her critique of the diary of Anne Frank that it may have been better for Anne's diary to have been burned or lost and thereby, quote, saved from a world that made of it all things, some of them true while floating lightly about, uh, over the heavier truth of named and inhabited evil. Thank you. So Catherine has agreed to take some questions. And first of all, thank you very much for a really brilliant paper and very much thought-provoking uh, and humbling paper. And that, that you really are able to harness so many ideas and issues into the contemporary challenges that we face. It's really, your contribution is really appreciated. Um, so I have a question, but before I ask the question, I want to make one quick announcement about this presentation. The announcement is for people at Yale University, Yale scholars and students. Tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., Catherine is having a very informal discussion with us uh, at Yisa. Uh, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock at 77 Prospect in Elias Place. Uh, so whoever would like to come, you're welcome. And just, so I have a question about the question. I asked a question. Actually, I have about 20 questions, but we'll ask one. Um, just a point of clarification, could you, um, how do you define Western culture? I, I, you guys don't have my footnotes. Um, here I say that I use the phrase Western culture to include the European nations and their national products in the Americas and the former British dominions, which of course Canada is one, uh, which until very recently have defined themselves as sharing a common culture based upon Christianity. Um, okay, so my question is this. I think, first of all, your comments about Ahmadinejad and Iran at the United Nations is um, extraordinarily important. Um, and, and your insights and analysis of this speech is important. And as, as, a, you know, as you must know, the themes that he uses and other radical Islamists use is often based on the protocols of the elders of Zion. So the, the document, the European Christian document that um, was exported and now is being re-imported 
South Africa when the Deputy Foreign Minister made comments about how Jews are controlling uh, the American economy in Wall Street just after the meltdown, speaking to an audience of 20,000 people, this received the greatest applause. Mm -hmm. so there, there, there is something happening among the dispossessed that we need to hear, and thank you for mentioning that. My question is, you seem to, in your, in your analysis, distance yourself, uh, or distance your understanding of anti-Semitism from various forms of racism, mm -hmm. uh, which I find interesting and I want to challenge, and yet at the same time you sort of come back to comparing and looking at the similarities between anti-Semitism and sexism. Mm -hmm. So I find that interesting, if you can clarify why sure. you do that. And just as a footnote, for somebody, I'm also Canadian, and I studied sort of Canadian colonial history, and the Canadian experience is interesting because of the French and British competing colonial models. And the French colonial model was very much an assimilationist mm -hmm. uh, approach, which the Métis um, experienced uh, sort of the French dominant uh, impact on, on them. But the British, who were more sort of segregationist than I'd say genocidal, um, were very much segregating the indigenous sort of First Nations population from the, from the settlers. And I did some work on uh, what happened in Newfoundland, which is always yeah, the wonderful. The Beothics. Where the Beothics <coughs> were completely wiped out, exterminated. The last person died in 1841. Her name was Sawandawit. And she, she died of natural causes, but she was the last person of, of Beothic descent to die. They were completely wiped out. And for 133 years, the British hunted them as sport and, and, and annihilated them. They, the, in in St. John's, Newfoundland, um, all the elementary school kids are taken to a museum in St. John's of the Biotic people. There are skeleton remains, and there's like a whole history that kids go through. And in my writings, I compared when the Nazis were trying to create a museum for the extinct Jewish race. Mm -hmm. And although I would certainly argue that the Holocaust is different in many ways, and should, and should be perceived as, as different and unique in many ways, there are similarities between European notions of superiority, of objectifying, racializing the other, which are common to what mm -hmm. the Jews experience. Mm -hmm. So what are the common sure. components? Okay, now I've forgotten your first question, but I'll answer the second <laughs> and you can refresh my memory. Um, yes, you, but one thing, well, you and I can talk about this after. One thing you'll notice is that I compared this very specifically to residential schools, because that is the equation being made, not the extermination of uh, the wiping out of the Beothic people. That is absolutely, I concur. Um, one, uh, so that, I think, answers that issue. Um, as far as can the Canadian colonialism and is it genocidal, it is certainly culturally genocidal. Genocide, of course, is a, is a term, uh, I don't know if many, how many of you have actually read the, the convention, but the definition is extremely broad. So there's no question that there is a genocide of indigenous peoples in Canada and certainly in the United States where the American army took a much more active role in their destruction. Um, another trauma, original trauma of this country that is overshadowed by slavery and uh, the African American history. Um, the, the, I guess the one difference, um, one of the differences, it's all, it always strikes me when I'm teaching the Holocaust just the other day showing the PBS film uh, that everybody should see called Auschwitz uh, Inside the Nazi State, which is really the cutting edge documentary. It's a source, it's not just a documentary, it's actually a scholarly source written and uh, produced by historians, the leading historians. Um, the, the pictures that were flashing on the screen of these Jewish children who were rounded up in France, they look like you and me. The, 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 that's that's the different. That's one of the differences. Just right off the top of my head is is the people who are involved in this, both Jews who are as European as European can be, particularly when we're talking about Western assimilated Jewish communities, and Germans. And this happens in the middle of the twentieth century. That I think for for many scholars is, and I know for for the man that I wrote my doctorate on. Uh, George Steiner. That's it. By the 20th century, we should have been making some bloody progress. If we want to talk about the French and Canadian colonial policies, we're talking about um, 15th, 16th, or 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century and into the 20th century. But by 1939, you'd think that um, 
the, the, the idea that this kind of, of racism and imperialism is applied to your own European neighbors is something that is just entirely bizarre. Um, so there is also a question of time and when this happens that makes it, um, for me at least, um, significant, there are some significant differences. Um, let me leave that there, but what was the first <coughs> question? Because I, I wanted to answer that question. Okay, so, um, so I, I, would say, I would say I don't think it's bizarre given the, the, the history of ideas and theology that you outlined so eloquently. I don't think it's bizarre, but we'll leave it. I, the question I had was, um, why do you seem to separate notions of anti-Semitism from racism, and yet you say I come back to connect it to issues of right. sexism? Um, sexism and anti-Semitism is something that I'm just presently, it's percolating, it's something that I want to look at because um, the, 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 the anti-Semitism that exists in Western culture is so, to, to, to many eyes, it is so subtle that people don't see it. And, and, and in that way, I think it operates like sexism. And so that's one thing that currently that I'm, I really want to start to actually think about. Um, with regard to racism, I mean, anti-Semitism can manifest itself in racial forms. And in, in, in that way, there are many similarities. But the way I like to see it is, uh, I'm gonna draw on the board for a second. Um, here's anti-Semitism, okay? And here's racism. In other words, uh, you can talk about racism and anti-Semitism, there are many similarities. And there is overlap, and there are racist forms of anti-Semitism. But that does, racism doesn't explain anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism predates racism, first of all, uh, by a, a good 1,500 years. You can't talk about, well, it's hard to talk about European racism until it actually is put in terms of race, right? Which is 19th century, late 18th. Um, with regard to when you're talking about um, coming into contact with people, you have to talk about the, the, the history of contact. Jews, of course, are in contact with the West from uh, antiquity. And so it is a much older, more complex uh, form. Ra racist anti-Semitism is one form. And of course there are similarities. That's not the issue. But the issue is that racism doesn't explain anti-Semitism. Following what was said about the Canadian historical case, um, I wonder if, uh, what is the uniqueness of the Holocaust. I mean, you have the Rwanda case, which has the Baha'i, the Kurds, uh, Tutsis, Armenians. I don't really see why you insist on the uniqueness of the Holocaust. So the second question I have is, um, you were very good at, at uh, criticizing What would be the literature you'd go to as a kind of a mainstay of teaching about anti-Semitism? Would it be the war against the, the Jews, or would it be the pity of it all, uh, or some alternative? Um, first of all, I want to just say I'm not critical of Anne Frank or of Knight, but um, dealing very much with current crit with with uh, criticism that that already exists that people really haven't uh, haven't internalized. Um, the books in and of themselves, I love the Diary of Anne Frank, as I say in my notes, I, I must have read it a hundred times uh, in my life and at and night as well um, when I went to university. Um, the problem is their, um, the rewriting that people have done. It's not the original texts that are problematic, it's, it's, it's what, what the public has done to them and what educators has done to them. So it's not the texts themselves. I don't want to go down in history as a critic of Anne Frank. That's not what I meant. Um, as far as sources, I find that in the courses that I teach, I don't focus on Jewish survivors, uh, Jewish survivor memoir literature. I don't bring Holocaust survivors into class. The vast majority of the, of the material that we read is um, written by and about anti-Semites. As I've told my students, too many of my students come into class wanting to study Jews, to understand anti-Semitism. What is it about these people that everybody can't stand? And I tell them, this is like taking 
um, a women's studies class, you want to learn about sexism and you're going to study women. You're not going to learn very much by studying Jews to learn about anti-Semitism. You have to read um, the history of the perpetrators. And that is, in fact, really the focus. And I will tell you, as I say here in the paper as well in a note, I really believe that that's one of the ways that this universalization has taken hold because of the way that Holocaust memoirs have been the focus of education, which can be universalized. And actually, the strategy of universalization is implicit in the educational programming because you have to touch that child in Iowa or that child in Winnipeg who doesn't know any Jews. That's the whole idea behind this. I assure you, if you are going to teach the work of Christopher Browning, for example, there's not a lot of ability there to universalize this. Jews are targeted specifically for destruction. How do you universalize that? So there is a difference between focusing on the victims exclusively and, and, and focusing on the perpetrators and on the machinery of destruction, which is the, the, the really the, my focus. It's not to say I don't bring in um, Jewish perspectives and res issues of resistance and, and coping and all of that is part of this. but. But there's no question that the where you put your emphasis has a huge effect on what people learn. And you will know that from this paper and this pedagogical studies on the diary, there's resistance to this material. It's terrible stuff. And I get up and have to teach these kids this, you know, day in and day out. I'm, I'm the ogre. You know, it's terrible stuff. There is a natural human... Um, reluctance to even want to engage with this. And in so many ways, you see students naturally engaging, in fact, with the Germans and not with Jews, identifying with them. We see this in the movie theaters. One of my students just told me about seeing that the movie about the boy in the striped pajamas. And she was horrified by the reaction of the theater in Winnipeg because the little Jewish boy died and nobody had cried a tear. And the little German boy, I haven't seen the film, but the little German boy died and there. So there is a lot going on in the material, and it really matters where you put your focus. And I think that for myself, um, I think those books are fine, but it depends on how they're taught. That's another part of it. Um, and I would definitely use the definitive edition of the diary. And, and perhaps what we need is a publisher who's going to translate the Yiddish version so that we can, uh, of night, so that we can... Um, that we can teach that in, in class as well. Um, I have a question about the universalization we are talking that you talk about, and I think that there's three or maybe it's not your field so much, but one arena where this universalization happens and very early is in the places where the Holocaust also happened, in, in communist Russia, in communist Poland, in communist Romania, I know just as an example in all these, these places where sort of there's both an anti-anti-Semitism campaign by the regime and also a drive to universalize the Holocaust. And I think that communist discourse has also had a great influence on the way the West or Western Europe or whatever thinks about the Holocaust. I think there's also that element of universalization through communism, through the left, that I think is also important for mm -hmm. this discussion. So it's more of a comment. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, I was wondering what, how you would take the, someone like Daniel Goldhagen's work, uh, who you know sees well, anti-Semitism as a um, you know a small part of a larger um, uh, reason for the Holocaust. I think that the the the, the, lo the biggest problem with Goldhagen's work, which has you know been um, critiqued ad nauseum is, uh, it, it really is uh, the case that miraculously this phenomenon disappears in 45. And of course, uh, just to explain that to people, uh, Goldhagen argues that there is such a thing as exterminationist anti-Semitism and it's unique to Germany. That alone is a problematic, um, problematic idea if you know the history of, of anti-Semitism which runs deep in all European countries. Uh, and in, in, in German history, um, 
you know, German, many German historians, of course, have rejected this entirely, including Holocaust historians. So that's, that's the argument. And of course, if there is this strain of exterminationist anti-Semitism that is kind of, you know, within Germans, or at least, you know, absolutely central to German culture, then how exactly does this end when the Americans impose uh, democracy on the West, on West Germany in 1945, miraculously it disappears. This is one of the reasons, of course, why the book was <coughs> trashed by scholars and loved by the German public. Um, the German public stood in lines to listen to Goldhagen, and one of the reasons why people fi figured out finally, what, what is with this book? It, it paints such an ugly picture of Germany, why do they like it? Um, they like it because it's done. In 45, it's done, it's, it's gone. And of course, it isn't gone. It absolutely it isn't gone in Germany, and it isn't gone here. Um, so Goldhagen's book is extremely problematic. Although I will say, I think that his the chapter on the uh, forced marches I think is very, very good. It's not the whole the whole book is not um, problematic, but the thesis is. don't know about where he grew up, but I had a recent conversation with my father, um, and his comment, his perception of the 60s was that it was the battle for equality of the African American that led to a, a strong drop in anti-Jewish prejudice in the United States. And I say that because, in a sense, that makes you too kind with your, your analysis about where the roots of universalism was. I mean, you could argue that the anti-Semitism was constant. It didn't lead to anti-racism. But it came from, in fact, the, the, the sequence is different. So I don't know if, if you've seen that in the scholarly literature, but he had a very clear perception. He's a very observant fellow. And that was his explanation of how American society changed. Yeah, well, think about that. Yeah. Uh, I want to say something about this. Angelica. <coughs> um, I just wanted to challenge you on the point that was raised earlier about questioning the uniqueness of the Holocaust. And what do you mean? Is this a qualitative, a quantitative statement? Is this about intention and motivation? And in particular, I ask because you contrast the Holocaust with the Canadian policy towards the Aborigines. And though the latter are certainly terrible. Aboriginal people. Just Aboriginal so you know, we have to be sensitive about terms. That, that's an Australian term. We're all particular about our terms, right? Between <coughs> Canada and the US. And okay, Australia. sorry, Aboriginal people. Um, and there's, there's a sense that there's, there is a difference between those two somehow in terms of quantity and quality. So for instance, when we bring in another situation, say um, the 19th and uh, or the 20th and 21st century um, Japanese policies, aggressive nationalism, rape, killing, all these things, um, chemical ex warfare, experimentation on the Chinese and Southeast Asians, numbering into the millions, very much, very possible over six million. You know, how, what does it mean to compare these two situations and argue that one is unique as opposed to the other, and what does it mean to study, study them? Okay, very, just very quickly, um, I realize I didn't answer this gentleman's, uh, one of the other questions that he asked. Very simply, um, the, 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 the attempt by the Germans is to annihilate all Jews. It is a comprehensive, systematic program to get rid, to actually exterminate European Jewry. And all of the various violence um, and atrocity that you're talking about um, <coughs> is not that. So that's very simply a, a very big difference there. How about the Tutsi? Um, the Tutsi and Hutu peoples, um, this is, of course, Rwanda, of course, is, is a, um, the genocide that occurs in Rwanda in 1994. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not a historian of Africa, and I'm not a comparative genocide historian. I think that there are some similarities. There's no question, and one can't really talk about that genocide again without talking about European imperialism because of the relationship that is created between the Hutu and Tutsi by the Belgians. <coughs> so there's a very big role to play, of course, by Europe there too. But as I've said, I, I, um, 
Um, I think part of the problem here too is that scholars who were trained in the Holocaust are then asked as professors to all of a sudden now be an expert in African history and be an, an expert in Asian history. And there is a fundamental level of frustration when you are trained in one area and trained at a fine <coughs> school at that and then be expected to be an expert on every uh, episode of hostility and killing on the planet. And I'll be honest, I really... Um, I, I don't feel um, particularly qualified to talk about the exact differences and similarities between Rwanda or other forms of genocide. Uh, and that's, it's not because um, I, I have a, a, a necessarily a special dedication to the Holocaust, but that, I'll be honest, I, 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 think, it's, it's, um, I think it's problematic, that some of these comparative courses. They, it's a surface treatment. Not the person is not an expert in all of these fields, um, and I, I think that um, there could be a history of the Rwandan genocide. Why does it have to be ho hooked up uh, to the Holocaust? Why can't we just talk about the Rwandan genocide? Why can't we talk about Japanese imperialism without always having to hitch it to Nazi imperialism? Um, th this is something we need to think about. We need to think about this. We really do. We really need to think about this and not automatically assume that the scholar somehow um, wants to privilege the Holocaust. But, you know, when you're a scholar trained in a field with languages and all of the apparatus that you're trained with, I'm now supposed to wade into one country in Africa. I mean, it's, you have to understand that this is somewhat, somewhat problematic. Now, and you will notice too in the paper that I don't necessarily say, I don't believe I say that the Holocaust is unique. What I said very specifically was that the Holocaust is increasingly compared to abortion. It's compared to human uh, animal abuse. It's an, it's it's compared to um, to residential schools in Canada. It's compared to slavery in the Americas. That's my point. And I never said the Holocaust was unique. That is not what I said. But what I said was that it is increasingly anything is a Holocaust. Any 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 uh, any particular episode of violence is now a Holocaust. And that, no, I don't agree with that. The other issue about anti-Semitism, I say anti-Semitism is unique, and I believe it is. I absolutely believe it is. It's history. If you study the history of anti-Semitism, you will see that it is not only racism. It is born in the theology of the Christian church in the divorce between Judaism and Christianity. Some scholars will even place it in antiquity. I don't. Yeah, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. And I wanted to ask you about um, and what was interesting to me is um, the discussion of literature. And I wanted to ask you, like, what, is, what do you think is the mechanism? Why do people want to? Is it the interpretation that people give to books? Is it that the books activate representation that we have, or the books create the representations? I mean, I'm interested in, in your perspective, like, not only books, uh, movies, all these kind of things. I think that actually, if my students are any indication, um, they're not big readers. <laughs> they are not. Um, they watch movies, and they, um, they will cite movies in papers as a source, right, a fictional film. Uh, some will ask if they should do that. <laughs> Others just do it. Um, and they assume, they assume that this is based on reality. I can't tell you how many emails I have from friends and family asking me if defiance is real. Is, is, is this true, right, Valkyrie, is this true? Do you want, should we go see that one, or should we avoid it? Um, so unfortunately, I think that reading in general, I don't know that not a, a, a Holocaust novel is going to necessarily reach them the same number of children that it would have two decades ago. A film, a video, which is of course a lot of the, um, a lot of the pedagogy now is on video and museum visits, rather again than reading, unfortunately. Um, so I don't even know that, uh, that Holocaust novels are that important for children and for, um, for students, unfortunately. We have a lot of questions. I'd sure. like to, 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 to,
because it sends the destruction of European Jews. I mean, from a context, I'm coming from Germany, this is a kind of, and that's probably about common sense. This is the, this is the core of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. It's a sense of uh, killing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was no purpose. Mm -hmm. in, in, in Rwanda, in, in Japan, there's a purpose. In, 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 in Canada, there's a purpose to make them civilized or to make money with them, whatever. There was no purpose in Auschwitz, and that's the point. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, Clement, I do. Um, let me just fill that out a little bit. Um, the idea of senselessness, this again goes to the heart of, uh, of anti-Semitism, is the terrible irrationality <coughs> at the center of it, which is to say the widespread belief by anti-Semites that there is an actually existing Jewish conspiracy. And by the way, this predates modern anti-Semitism. This is another problem I have with some of the analysis. The conspiracy is, is, in, is in Christian theology. It pre-exists there. Very little of it does not exist there. Okay? So, yes, exactly. That there is this fundamental, irrational commitment to the belief in a Jewish conspiracy that is animating all the evil in the world and that is going to bring us to the edge of destruction if we don't act against it, which is, of course, what makes anti-Semitism so dangerous, because <coughs> the belief spurs you on to create a movement to react against it, right? It is provocative by its very nature. It's calling out for action against Jews to, to, to destroy this conspiracy that threatens the world. And this is still what we see today. This is the same, uh, the same dynamic, the same... Um, the same movement, the same ideas, the same con conceptions. And that is what is fundamentally <coughs> irrational about it. It's not a conflict over land. It's not a conflict over culture, necessarily. It's not a, 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 a fight over property. It's, you know, and, and I agree with you, Clemens. I think that you can actually take away many of the things that people compare to the Holocaust by using that, that uh, analysis. Maybe not all, but but most. Like um, over the decades, I have heard excellent talks. Yours is one of them. Thank you. However, anti-Semitism is blooming. In spite of hundreds of books that have been written, hundreds of talks that have been given. Anti-Semitism is now flourishing all over the world, almost. Certainly in Europe, it has a tremendous upheaval, and in, in other places of the world also. I would like to know one thing. It's interesting to hear all the analysis, and I agree with all of them. It's true. However, I would like to hear a word about, is there a remedy? A remedy. A remedy. Oh, I knew this. I knew this was going to be asked. I did know that. Um, I think uh, not to not to uh, draw the focus on me personally. But I must be a little bit of a blue or hope because I'm not Jewish. And um, that must offer some possibility, <laughs> right? Um, remedy. Uh, I'm one person, I can't do it all. Somebody has to help me out here. Um, but it's just to say that it's, I'm not arguing that Gentiles are uh, genetically coded with anti-Semitism, right?